Yeah, I'm on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just, yeah. And then hopefully, th if this works, then I can do a demo after. But if it doesn't, I can't. I don't know if you have your computer or your it's your slides up there. Uh, PowerPoint. PowerPoint. You can drop the PowerPoint down there so you don't have to do some paper work in your desk. I'm not sure if all the clips and stuff will come across over there. Oh, that's true. I guess you could drop. I just picked up one of the footer. Yeah, so if you can drop the end one, it's gonna be good. All right. Well, I'm just gonna get started with the, some basic background stuff first. All right. So we're gonna start before this works. Um, so my name is Matt Damaris. I go by Matt the Maker. Um, I've been programming since 2004, teaching and teaching myself and volunteering since 07 and making things since 2012. Uh, I've never been to Hope. I've never done anything like this. But I truly enjoy uh, sorry, coding and uh, making things. Um, well, no, I'll screw that. You get it? Yes, thank you. All right, so um, one of my more recent projects is a wearable computer that is quite capable and easily customized that I'll talk about later. Um, over the last few years, I've modernized my local food pantry, but in order to properly explain what I did, I'm gonna have to provide some background inf info on our food pantry and food pantries in general. So generally, food pantries are comprised of older volunteers with manual operations and minimal use of technology and I'm gonna show you that a little technology can go a long way. So um, I don't have any degrees. I tried to go to a four-year school, four school twice and found out that I had a few screws loose. So I ended up taking things at my own pace, taking, filling in gaps in knowledge at my community college. And then my uh, methods for teaching myself is I follow and modify tutorials until I'm comfortable with the hardware. And then once I know some hardware, you can mix them up, make different combinations, and create new things. So where I volunteer is a 100% volunteer organization serving the residents of my town since 1983. Um, not all food pantries are 100% volunteer, and depending on where you get your funding from, um, you may have to pay staff members. So the mission of the Sandwich Food Pantry is to distribute food and essential non-food items to families who live, work, or attend religious services in my community. And so we refer people to other services available to them, and we, we never turn anyone away who comes for help. We'll give them an emergency food order and refer non-clients to a food pantry that serves their community. We're about 40 volunteers. Before COVID, we were around 80 volunteers. So things have really changed in that department, mainly because the um, volunteer population is uh, generally older folks and they're the most at risk. So there's always people struggling, no matter how good or bad the economy may be due to things like injuries or disabilities, temporary unemployment or a senior citizen's fixed income. Uh, we rely on donations from individuals as well as local businesses. And uh, we also apply for a few grants um, so how we get food, um, we get two orders a month from the Greater Boston Food Bank, but prior to six months ago, uh, we were getting 3,500 pounds twice a month. Now we're down to 1,200 pounds twice a month, so we're at 35% of what we were taking in, and it's due to a labor shortage. It's not a food shortage. It's um, tip, just labor. Um, so... We have a weekly pickup of items from the two local stop and shops. We pick up bread and um, bakery items that we give out on Wednesdays. And uh, there's also donation bins inside the store that we pick up at that time as well. Uh, we get donations from individuals in town, different groups. And if we need to, we buy things from either Cisco or we'll buy it from the store. And we've been having to buy a lot of our food from less economical sources 
because we'd rather just get it from the food bank. Um, so there's two main philosophies when it comes to food pantries. There's the standardized food box or bag model, which I'm going to refer to as pre-packed. Then there's the client choice model. The client choice model is the preferred model because it offers higher satisfaction with food clients are able to choose. They tend not to take food they won't use, and it's greater uh, opportunities for volunteer client interaction. Uh, hybrid models also exist, so partially prepacked and partially choices. And all these things are influenced by your equipment, your physical space, the number of volunteers, and the number of clients. But within client choice food pantries, there are different models, and you can mix and match these as well. So uh, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just um, a few of the uh, popular ones. So there's the table model where you need space to lay out tables, lay out the food, and clients will pack the food. Then there's the supermarket model, which requires more space because you're using carts and shelving and that type of thing. And in that model, clients pack the food. There's the window model where all you need is a shelf and an area where the client can view the food and point to the items they want, and a volunteer will pack the food. And finally, there's the inventory list model, which works down from the smallest place to uh, large places, uh, where you provide a, basically a list of check boxes for people to choose what they want, and then uh, volunteers pack the food. So how we operated from 2007 to 2020, we used the inventory list model and the table model. We were a very manual operation at that time. We had two volunteers who would check clients in, give them a number disc and a color-coded order form. And then we had a waiting area of chairs. So they would check in, they'd wait, and then they'd see the assistant one at a time who would go over additional choices that, for that week. And then once they finished their um, inventory list, they would go to the packing room where we had one volunteer reading the list out loud and the other volunteers packing the items. Uh, and in the front area, we have um, bread and produce tables with one volunteer at each table. And then at the, once the clients are all done, they drive around the back of the building and two volunteers load their vehicle. Um, so I did all kinds of jobs. I started doing some pretty menial tasks like writing dates on um, items putting things away, grinding coffee, bringing orders out, photocopying our order forms, unloading food bank orders, restocking the packing room, and packing orders. So over time, I was able to um, get the full picture of how the organization operates. And um, so our IT infrastructure from 2007 to 2020, we had an access database. We always had two old desktops that were always out of date. Um, one laptop that was from 2014, and some outdated office equipment, and last but not least, we had uh, DSL internet. Um, so in 2017, I made my first thing for the food pantry. So I basically assisted the client assistant by displaying the choices uh, available for that week on a uh, old monitor, and then I upgraded to an old TV. It allowed clients to get through the process faster, and we would um, update it weekly. This is what, so on the left is the original one, and on the right is the better looking model. We ended up using that for three years. Um, in 2018, I found out we would periodically lose the contents of a freezer uh, due to human error or equipment failure, and I thought I could fix that. So I developed a freezer alarm and installed, initially installed four. It's very simple, um, a couple door sensors, a thermocouple and an amplifier board, a buzzer and an RGB LED. It cost approximately $75 each. Um, they would upload the temperature to Adafruit IO every minute. And if an alarm went off, we would get a, te get a text with Twilio. So you get a text, you check the graph, and then you can kind of tell what's going on. Uh, here's some pictures from the first time I, the first alarm I installed. It's not pretty, but it's pretty effective. 
Um, this is a double door model, so you can see I got the pie on top of the freezer, a couple LEDs, and the other hardware. Um, so what I had to do was I didn't know what an alarm was. I didn't know what condition signified an issue. So I ended up unplugging two freezers for eight hours, um, which then led me to see that a full freezer when it's dead is like a log function. It gets up to 20 after a few hours, but then it just kind of levels off into the 20s for at least a couple of days. But so my conditions for the uh, alarm are over 20 Fahrenheit for over 30 minutes. Uh, it'll happen if someone opens the door during a defrost or if someone repeatedly has the door open for more than a half hour. And it, the other condition that happens in is when a freezer is dead. Um, the, the door alarms are pretty effective. After five minutes, um, the alarm goes off, but for the minute prior to the alarm, it starts beeping, and that usually catches people's attention before the alarm goes off to address the issue. Um, but the, with the double door freezers, volunteers would constantly set them off. Every time we got a food bank order, um, they laid all in front of the freezer, opened the doors, and set the alarm off because stuff was in the way, they couldn't close the doors. So I added motion sensors to those um, freezers, and what that does is simply restart the door timer every time uh, motion's, it's activated by motion. Um, I also had to create two fridge alarms, and it's a little bit more complex because you need to be above and below a certain temperature instead of just below. So my alarm conditions I came up with is 33 or below for a minute because you don't want anything to freeze. That's not good. Um, and then over 43 for 20 minutes. So according to the FDA, if you store food in a refrigerator and it's 43 to 45 degrees and it's been two hours, it needs to be thrown away. So that's why I chose above 43 for 20 minutes. The defrost won't set it off, but it's still early enough in the process to still intervene. And when we got one of these fridges, we plugged it in. It was behaving like a freezer. It was, it was freezing everything. So I ended up using the temperature sensor from the alarm to calibrate the fridges, which worked pretty well. Um, about a month after I installed the first alarms, I got a text message from Freezer 5. Uh, freezer 5, that door is cursed. So every time, you, if you slam the door, the door bounces off the frame, the lock pops out, and the door is locked open. And so um, that, that happens a couple times a year now. Um, but it, we used, every time it used to happen, we'd lose whatever was in those freezers. Um, so in 2019, um, I decided I was going to learn Salesforce. And uh, Salesforce is available for nonprofits for free up to 10 seats. But that doesn't come with any development or anything. You have to do it all yourself. So in uh, November 2019, I started developing a uh, Salesforce system to do our reporting to the food bank. So if you order from a food bank, you have to report uh, certain information to them, just general totals of certain things. And so, um, so I started to do that in uh, Salesforce. So. I created a custom record object for our clients and orders. It took me a couple weeks to clean up the data because it was 30 years of fat fingering. And um, so I was able to import all of our client data into the Salesforce system and recreate all everything we would do. I had it done in January 2020. So we ran parallel to the access system for the month of February. Now, what I mean by that is we would just generate reports, compare the reports, make sure they match up. Um, so one thing I did when I had access to our client database was I geocoded the data because I wanted to see where our clients came from. Uh, I wasn't sure if there was going to be any pattern or rhyme or reason to it. It turns out there isn't because shit happens and everyone needs help at some point. Because we serve people who live, work, or pray in our community, you can see that it greatly exceeds our town boundary. Um, so here's where it got interesting. Our original COVID protocol and Salesforce deployment took place at the same time. 
that's me up on the left there, terrified, at a podium. Um, and so what I did was I checked the first client in on the laptop, and that was it. I couldn't, I couldn't check anybody else in. I couldn't do anything except stand there and feel useless. So uh, what I ended up doing, we had two crews of six volunteers. We would um, prepack all of the orders. This is when we started ordering produce from Cisco. And so my job was to check people in, which I ended up doing from my mobile phone. And to keep track of family size, I used colored coded post-its and just slap them on the windshield once I checked people in to tell the other volunteers what they need to do or and how many choices to offer. So then that freed me up so I could check in six cars, help, make, help them all get out of the, through the process and record the bag totals. Um, we operated drive throughs for six months, but uh, it was really rough because uh, most of our volunteers are older and we have, and, and all the food was outside in the summer heat and same with the volunteers. So um, I, uh, I also noticed we went through way more inventory and, I, and the last thing I noticed was that at least half of our clients had smartphones, which gave me an idea. Um, so we had one volunteer bring out the non-perishable and the household items. That's the volunteer I would help the most. Then we would pack dairy on demand by family size. We had a table of bread and a table of produce with one volunteer offering choices. Uh, and then we had a meat cooler with uh, one volunteer offering choices. Um, and this is where I want to get into uh, like my public service announcement. We use Google Workspace for everything. I've made accounts for every individual in our organization as well as different roles within our organization. It's really helpful. You can make up to 2,000 users for free. Um, and that's the foundation of our uh, IT going post-COVID. Um, Salesforce offers 10 users for free, but you have to develop it yourself. Microsoft Cloud, 10 users for free. But the only reason we got Microsoft Cloud was to get um, five free copies of Offline Office, because that's the only way to do it now. Um, we also use Twilio for all our texting, and they will give you a $500 credit to your account if you're doing it on behalf of a nonprofit. And then there's some other services we get discounts on. Um, so in June 2020, so a few months into the drive through situation, I started developing an ordering system. It originally was going to be just a numbering system using text messages and a uh, receipt printer. But um, every time I showed them what I was working on, they asked me to take it a step further. So um, I ended up building a now serving sign. And uh, everyone in our organization has a mobile phone. So I put pushover on their phones, which allows them to see um, numbers given out numbers called as well as orders submitted. So when a client walks in, our volunteers can greet them by name um, just by taking a quick glance at their phone. Uh, so we use Formstack to take the orders. And to receive orders, we use Zapier. So um, Zapier is, uh, it takes the Formstack order submission and then we turn it into an HTML formatted email and that allows us to just use Gmail on the packing station to pick up orders. Uh, I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, so this is the number machine. It's not very sophisticated. It's just um, cost about $70 in parts and about $12 to $15 a year to uh, $175 a year to run. So it works. You put your hand on the top and it will print out the um, order form, I mean, I mean the, the number, and then I had to build a uh, number sign, so it's like a now serving sign. I doubled up the LED matrices because we had some older clients um, who complained that they couldn't see the numbers from the car. So I 3D printed that little thing up in the uh, top center just to hold the signs together. Um, so in total, the, si uh, the signs cost 165 to build. And then originally, we weren't going to have a packing station. My plan was to use volunteers' phones to handle that aspect of things. But in talking with the other 
people in the organization, they wanted something like this, so it added another $500 to the cost of the system. Um, so the cost associated with running the ordering system would, between Formstack and Zapier is $60 a month or $725 a year. So in, in total, um, the ordering system costs about 750 bucks. If we didn't have the packing station, it would be 250 bucks. Um, it's $75 a month to run, which equals about $900 a year. So we save, we save more inventory a month than we spend on the system. Um, and I made it because we needed something and I knew our process. So I was able to create something that we could just work with because it was based on our underlying processes that we used to have. Um, after learning about all the things I did for the food pantry, the board of directors decided to compensate me for quite a bit of work over the last few years. And it was, it was pretty nice to be um, paid for something that I had already finished. It's like I didn't have to do anything else. Uh, so how we operate now, you can see the packing station is down at the end there. You can see the alarms the blue lights on the alarms. So we've been using a digital inventory list model, which I believe any inventory list model can be digitized. So a lot of food pantries could go digital rather quickly if they have the underlying processes behind the paper system. And we also switch to the supermarket model. So we have, now we have one volunteer signing in clients on the other side of the building. The waiting room is outside or in a vehicle if the weather sucks. The packing room is two volunteers. That's where I am. I operate the packing station. Um, and in the front room, we have two volunteers to just help assist clients fill their carts and get the proper number of choices for their family size. And then when they're done, we still have the back door. Clients drive around back, we load the order in their car. Um, this is the original order form. So you can see it's pretty basic. You just have name, uh, order number, phone number, and a bunch of check boxes. Um, unfortunately, the number of meat choices we were offering was based on the family size, and that would not always be entered in correctly. So what ended up happening is I'd have to track down someone who put in more or less choices than they were supposed to get and figure out what they actually wanted. So that was enough of a problem where we ended up getting a new client freezer for the front room. So we ordered a three-door freezer and we had to wait five months to get it. Three days after it was plugged in, it died. So it died so fast we hadn't even put food in it yet and I hadn't put an alarm on it. So once it was repaired, I put the alarm on it. I basically used a stripped down model like the fridge because this freezer has auto closing doors. And so we loaded it with food, and this is what the um, alarm looks like, the stripped down one. Um, so then it died again. So here's where I'll show you my logic. So I marked it failing at around 7 p.m. The alarm triggered around 9, and we had to empty it. We emptied it around 10.30 p.m. Um, as you can see, after we emptied it, it continued to not work. So this is what we came into. One of the ladies was very upset when she came in and saw the freezer was reading 41, but luckily I reassured her that sensor was located in the top of the unit and the sensor I have in there was still reading in the mid 20s. So we felt a lot better after that. So we, we had to empty everything. So then it was, you can see it was fixed again. And then three days later, died again. We had to re-empty it, wait for them to come in fix it again, and you see those last two spikes on the right? That's the fourth motor blowing. So what happened? We had four OEM motors had died. Just didn't last more than a few days each. They chalked it up to supply chain issues, which they said they didn't have, but obviously they did. So if I didn't have an alarm on that freezer, we would have lost the most amount of food we ever would have lost at a time, not once, but twice. And that would have been some really bad PR for that company. So I redid the order form. Now that we didn't have meat choices on the order form, I was able to offer some static choices um, 
to, for certain items. So you can pick which type of veggies you get. You can pick which type of jelly you get. You can pick butter or margarine, coffee, and baking mix. Um, it's just nice to offer people choices because they really appreciate it. So here's something we could never do when we were on paper. I can dump our ordering system anytime I want. So this is our last 250 orders. You can see the most popular items are eggs and toilet paper. But then again, only 85% of people want those items. What I ended up noticing is if we were still prepacking orders, this would be a blue rectangle, but it's not. People choose only what they need. So on face value, we save 43% of our inventory by letting people pick what they want. But when you take into account family size, which influences the number of items that are headed out the door, it's over a 50% savings on inventory simply by letting people pick what they want. Um, we had some more freezer problems. Um, I, I really like the freezer alarms because most of the time I don't hear from them. And every time I hear from them, I get credited for saving the day. So uh, we had an alarm go off. So I noticed the freezer stopped working for about eight hours. So we emptied it. We called the refrigeration company. They, they came in. It was working when they were there. So they said nothing was wrong. So um, about seven days later, it stopped for 24 hours. But again, by the time the refrigeration company got there, it was working again. So nothing was wrong. About a week later, we had a catastrophic, catastrophic freeze over, and all the boards and sensors in the unit were replaced. And since then, that unit's been OK. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had our client freezer, you know, the one that died four times. Uh, we had it freeze over a little bit. And I was able to uh, notice, based the, I was able to notice these patterns. And we were able to uh, figure out that inside the unit had just, due to humidity, had uh, built up enough ice to impact the performance of the unit. So we just took a heat gun and uh, melted it, and then it was back to business. So um, our IT infrastructure from 2020 till now, we use Salesforce, two desktops that I picked out last year, one laptop I picked out in 2020. We use Workspace for email and documents. We've got some nice printers, the color laser jet. Uh, we have Raspberry Pis protecting our um, food, as well as the ordering system helping us uh, save inventory. And we finally upgraded to Comcast Internet because I threw a hissy fit um, when we were still on DSL. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's pretty much everything I've done at the food pantry in the last few years. It is, um, it is a lot of fun to work with these people. Now, they may not be technical people. They can use the systems you set up for them but they cannot set up anything for themselves. So these organizations need people like us to set up services for them to help them operate better. So in uh, 2017, uh, I built the um, first prototype of a wearable computer using a Raspberry Pi. I will, uh, this is from the day the day I actually created it, I went on show and tell and showed it off a little bit. So. Uh, hey, man, I'm, I'm right this uh, hey guys, um, this is in the early uh, prototype phase. I, I, I don't know if you can hear that. The bulky Pi Zero and the Wi-Fi hat with uh, the Pi Zero W, but this is what it looks like so far. Ooh, cool. So what I've done with the code is I've lined up the zoom on the camera so it lines up with your field of vision, so it's kind of like augmented reality. And I'll be adding the user interface on top of that. Outstanding. Ooh. There's already more users of your thing than Google Glass. Congratulations. <laughs> so that was the first version. So I used the Pi Zero and a Wi-Fi hat and a camera. Um, eventually, I, I kept working on this project weekly. I went back on Show and Tell quite a few times. And then I ended up building or making a guide for version one of Pi Glass in 2017. So this is version one. You can see it's really bulky and pretty janky, but um, it, 
it works pretty well. Um, unfortunately, after a while, um, I couldn't take the project any further. Um, it, it cost about $300 to make and, and, and an hour and 20 minutes to assemble. Most of that was um, doing the soldering because I struggle with that sometimes. So it's made of some basic parts. There's safety glasses, a Pi Zero W, a viewfind display. You have the Raspberry Pi spy cam on there. I used an audio hat with a bone conduction transducer mounted to the frame. Um, everything is held together with zip ties and heat shrink. And then in uh, 2021, uh, when the Pi Zero 2 came out, I decided to revisit the concept. So I rebuilt it with um, safety glasses, but this time I used, a, instead of putting the Pi on the side of my head, I put the Pi on the back of my head with a baseball cap. It makes it look a lot more streamlined and it's easier to assemble. Um, so I used the Pi Zero 2, the same display, the same camera. I used a better audio board that actually has two MEMS microphones on it, so it functions like a speakerphone. So when you're live streaming or recording a video, you actually have audio. Uh, and then the bone conduction transducer is mounted to um, the frame with a heat shrink. And then um, instead of... The, the version one was controlled with SSH from a phone and it was kind of cumbersome and stuff. So I ended up using a Bluetooth gamepad to uh, create my interface. And uh, this model is also held together with zip ties and heat shrink. Uh, here's some pictures of version two. So I got the assembled thing on the left and me wearing it on the right. Um, now, instead of SSH on a phone, I created uh, a user interface. So the, um, so the way the user interface is triggered is there's a button on the audio hat on the back of your head, and that will either start the application launcher or it will kill any program that could be running. So you typically launch your program, do your thing, push the button when you're done. Um, and the, everything is controlled with this 8-bit do's tiny little 02 gamepad. Uh, it's used to, uh, well, the, the main thing is the application launcher, which I will uh, show you how that works. So when I was working on the project initially, everything was hard-coded. I had to edit two files, add about 20 lines to add an option to the um, application launcher. So I created a markup file uh, to handle that for me. So you give it a name, a color for rainbow mode, because I have rainbow mode, and um, the command you want to run or the shell script that you want to run, and then you put the associated processes with those commands on the uh, last line so you can uh, successfully launch applications and, and um, terminate them when you want to. Um, there are five main pieces of um, Pyglass version two. So FFmpegs for live streaming. You can live stream to any RTMP service. Uh, I have Kodi for watching movies, Netflix, YouTube, that type of thing. Uh, I use OpenCV for um, camera related functions. Uh, most of the, all the applications I wrote for this version are in Python. And last but not least, I have RetroPy, so we can uh, play uh, SNES, NES games and stuff. In, um, so in March, um, March of this year, I made it into uh, Raspberry Pi Magazine, which was pretty cool. They're really nice people, and um, they definitely appreciated me sharing this project with them. One of the coolest things that they said um, was that they look forward to the cyberpunk cyberglass future. So that gave me an idea. I had been working on a guide for my website, um, which it wasn't that great. Uh, I ended up contacting the folks at Adafruit to see if, they, if I could write a guide for version two. 
because I wrote one for version one. So they said yes, and then I was terrified because it wasn't done. Um, I, I still had quite a bit of work to do. My uh, application launcher was still hard coded at the time. So this is the point where I created the uh, markup file to make it easy. Um, one thing I would love to show you is exactly how easy it is to make this version. You take four pieces of heat shrink for the bone conduction transducer and you mount it to the glasses frame. And then um, you attach it to the audio board, mount the camera, mount the mount for the display. It's two zip ties to mount the pie to the hat. Then you just have to run a camera cable down the side of it to the front. And um, that's all it takes. So the entire process to create one of these glasses is about 20 minutes, which is um, surprisingly, it, you, you'd be, it's done before you, you even get started almost. Um, one of the, the main things I wanted to show you is uh, I used OpenCV for, uh, to create my own filter program. So it does facial recognition and you can overlay whichever image you want on different locations on people's faces. So you can see I got a brain blender and a dumb sticker. Oh, it's not up there? Okay. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, I guess I can't show you that stuff, but if, if, I can, if I can get the demo to work, I'll do a quick little um, demo for you guys. And Matt, while you do that, yep. can we take some questions or would you prefer not to multitask? Uh, I can multitask. Okay. We have one question in the chat. Okay. Are there any tutorials on YouTube for the fridge alarm system you made? Um, there's no tutorials on YouTube, but I, it is on GitHub. Nice. Um, I can provide the link to that after if necessary. Um, any other questions? Uh, I'm waiting on Bob to post a little CD that's uh, stuff that you use for some of those drones. Uh, Mike, I'm interested, do you have any plans uh, uh, to, like, expand this to other channels? Like, how do you get this to other, uh, how do you get other channels online and stuff like that? You see, that's the interesting question. When I started out, on this path, I was looking for open source solutions to this problem, and I couldn't find any. So I didn't want to try to build something out all myself, so I just went through the path of least resistance in terms of free services. But there should be open source solutions to these problems that I guess are going to have to be created. Um, that would, that I haven't thought of that, but that's that's a good idea. That would be cool. Like send out a IoT freezer kit to somebody, and they set it up and get it going. Or better yet, when you engage with the freezer company, some some systems to put it in the rack. Yeah. One thing I noticed is there's a lot of stuff. Like we have a wide variety of equipment. Some's analog, some's digital. We don't have problems with the analog equipment. We have problems with the digital equipment. You know, like, and it's, it's a little frustrating at times knowing that the old technology worked fine and then they throw a computer in it and now it sucks.
definitely like do some documentation. Like this is a dead one. This one's okay. Yeah. Like, what are you using to make your dots? I'm just using um, Adafruit IO, which is free. Um, it's basically an MQTT service. And um, the you, you just they have dashboards that you can just drag a line chart into. And Sounds like we got a Hackers Got Talent presentation coming up from Matt tonight, <laughs> I think, right? Give him a round of applause if you'd like to see some of that. <laughs> These are great questions. We have about five more minutes for questions if anybody wanna keep interacting. If I may, I know, you know, during my day job, I do AVP of quality and data for a nonprofit, and it's a health organization. One of our departments is a food pantry, and I'm already texting and sending pictures because pantry is a big deal. And during COVID, you know, there was a, just so many more people that needed food and managing that, and you couldn't give it in person. So, like, what you're doing is amazing, and you alluded to this. Someone in the audience already alluded, you know, People like you with your talents and your brains can benefit so many on the ground people that are doing these services for the population that don't have the skills, we're struggling with figuring out systems and QR codes and there are these tech companies that are selling this to you for hundreds of thousands of dollars, thousands just you know, gauging the prices for something that can be done for so much less. Um, so. If you want to use your talents for something good and make a couple of bucks, you know, I don't know about hundreds of thousands of dollars, but you know, definitely reach out and Matt, I'm gonna speak to you later. offer choices on our non-perishable items, so that's what we the people are ordering and we're pre or we're packing for them at the time. Um, the other, are like the produce, the bread, the, all that stuff is on um, is in like a shopping area. So we're only they're only ordering the non-perishable items, which could be on the shelf for a very long time. And instead of because when when we were doing the drive-throughs and giving everyone everything. We went through inventory at like three or four X of what we used to, and providing choices on those items was the, it created the biggest confusion. So if you have any static uh, choices on your um, menu, you could offer those as like an uh, inventory list. All right, so let's see if one more time we We have one minute. All right, I'm gonna, who, wants, who doesn't wanna be on Twitter? Who doesn't want to be on Twitter? Do you want me to get, get, get kicked off of Twitter? No, 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 no. <laughs> like, who, wants, who doesn't want their picture on Twitter? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we're all masking it. Yeah, we're all masking it. All right. Yeah. See if this works. So then, you go to the keyboard, and you type in what you want your tweet to be. So. Oh. 
and that's it. So um, as soon as you up, then we start this. So I use the um, I forget which API it is, but it's a Python uh, API for Twitter. Um, I think it's Scipio. Or Um, at Matt the Maker, but there's an underscore in front of that. Let's give Matt another round of applause, everybody. And, and someone else in the Matrix chat said, making these things into kits would be amazing. So Matt, we got you a business plan coming up. So anybody with any ideas for Matt, find them and hook it up. Thank you so much. The next talk is defensive computing. And remember, hackers got talent tonight.